We're talking about cybersecurity today and how safe people's passwords are. What is one of your online passwords currently? It is my dog's name and the year I graduated from high school. Oh, what kind of dog do you have? I have a Chihuahua Papillon. And what's its name? Jameson. Jameson. And where'd you go to school? Um, I went to school back in Greensburg, Pennsylvania. What school? Uh, Hempfield Area Senior High School. Oh, when did you graduate? In 2009. Oh, great. It's like my cat's name and then just like a random number. Okay. Has you had this cat for a while? Yeah, she's my childhood pet. Aw. And what's her name? Her name is Jolie. Jolie. Mm -hmm. So like a password of yours would be Jolie and then a number. Yeah. Like number one? Uh, like my birthday. Oh, when is your birthday? Uh, June 12th. Oh, nice. And what year were you born? Uh, 95. Oh, great. Mm -hmm. So Jolie, 6, 12, oh, 95. Yes. Got it. So you mean to give my password right now? No, I cannot do that. But we all want to know what it is so we can tell you if it's strong or not. Oh, my goodness. Um, um, let me think. Okay, one is Tel Aviv. Yeah. Four, six, eight. And then Israel. It's, it's only three, but it's, you know, it's, uh, for me, it's strong enough. Ireland, one, two, three, four. Gemma, one, two, three. Spell G-E-M-M-A. Well, most of them are Italian. Oh, beautiful. Yeah, like so what, like. Like, what's a good Italian password? Uh, my grandma's name. What's your grandma's uh, name? Uh, Maria. Maria. So Maria is your password? Oh, yeah, now you know my password. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. I love this because it's like no matter how good your systems are and how strong they are, someone is still going to go and say something stupid <laughs> like that. It's kind of clever though because like the, the reporter is not sort of going in hard and she's not going, just give me your password, right? Like she socially engineers them. You know, like what kind of dog do you have? Where did you go to school? And then she eventually gets to the point of getting out the info she wants. So uh, yeah, I, I thought it was pretty funny. Now. Moving on to uh, many other funny things and many other security things. Hacking in kids. So this is a really interesting thing where when we look at how easy it is for kids to hack into systems, you start to think the web's just a little bit broken. And when you have a look around at everything that's going on, you can't help but notice that there are hackers absolutely everywhere. And what I want to show you in this talk is where we find some of these hackers, who they are, what they're doing, and we're going to do a bunch of demos as well. So how are they actually getting into systems and how easy it is? So we're going to dumb it down to the, to the almost scary level of, holy shit, it's that simple. <laughs> so where I thought we might start is to have a little bit of a think about how we perceive hackers. Because we all see a lot of news, right? The whole time, something in the news about someone hacking something. And one of the things that news outlets like to do is they like to have stock photos. And when you have a look at what a hacker is, you notice some trends. What do you reckon the first trend is that stands out here? Hoodies. It's hoodies. Hackers have hoodies, number one. <laughs> number two, there is a, there's a lot of green screen, a lot of binary going on. Hackers like binary, believe it or not. And we see this trend played out over and over and over again. Now, recently, there was, uh, there was a little uh, Indiegogo project launched for a security in a box project called uh, Cujo. And you plug Cujo into your home and it repels hackers. Like magic. That got a little bit of a clip that shows you how it works. You may not know it, but you've probably already been hacked. Thousands of hacking attacks occur each day. Now how do we know he's a hacker? Hoodie. Hoodie. Right, exactly. Now, and he also has a cigar. Uh, you notice also that there is some scary music just to set the scene. The other way we know he's a hacker is he's got green text on the screen. That's a very important giveaway. Uh, but there is something kind of odd about what he is doing on the screen. And if we, if we zoom in and we go all CSI enhance on one of the, the shots there, it's like he's hacking in a browser, right? Because there's a browser Chrome, there's an address bar there. And I saw this a while back and I thought, well, this is, this is really curious. I must figure out how this is done. And I figured it out and I'm going to show you and your kids how to do this as well. So what you do is you jump over to a web browser and you go to this website called hackertyper.net, okay? Now, when you're on hackertyper.net, what you do is you start to mash the keyboard like this. 
Now, this is awesome, but it gets better, because what you do is while you're hacking away, and then you say, look, I'm, like, I'm hacking the Pentagon or something like that. Hacking the Pentagon. Oh, damn it, I didn't get in. Uh, and then what you do is you hack a bit more. Let's try this again. I, I think I got it. I think I got it. Hack, 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 hack. Yes, we're in. <laughs> Hackertyper.net. Uh, endless entertainment. And that is actually what they used in the Cujo video to convince you that you need the security in a box product inside your home to keep the hackers away. I wrote a blog post last week where I zoomed in and said, here is the code from hackertyper.net, here is the code from Cujo. So uh, that's, uh, that's an interesting approach on their behalf. They're also doing things like there's a guy on a Mac with a screen capture that's available on Google Images of a Windows XP box with fake antivirus. Cujo will stop that. <laughs> so, so that's how, uh, how easy it is to start hacking. Now, in reality, most of the time when we see these hackers, uh, they're more like this. This is anonymous, regrouping. <laughs> Some of them have hoodies. This is more likely going to be the people that are breaking into many of these systems, making uh, names for themselves on the news. And what we end up seeing, once they take off the masks and the hoodies and all that sort of thing, uh, is they're more like this guy. Ryan Cleary. So he was uh, part of LulzSec, and around that sort of 2011 period, they were actually quite successful breaking into stuff. Did a lot of social engineering, these guys, very effective social engineers. Kids are very good at pushing your buttons <laughs> and twisting you to your will. Those of you who are parents know what I mean. So Ryan is here at 19, and he's in court with his mum. Look at his mum. She is pissed. Not just him, it was Jake Davies as well. He was also part of LulzSec. His mum's not real impressed either. Out there at court, getting busted for breaking into stuff. Didn't work out real well for them. Mind you, they're in the UK. It worked out a lot better for them than the guys in the US who end up facing charges pretty much the same as if you'd gone and killed a bunch of people. The US has gone kind of nuts with uh, how they treat hackers. So there's these guys, and this is often who's breaking into systems, and we see this pattern play out time and time again. And another good example of this was uh, Talk Talk last year. So Talk Talk is a UK telco, so think like Optus, Telstra, that sort of thing. And they got broken into, and they had a lot of their data stolen. And just after it happened, there was a lot of press, and there was a bit in the news where the detective came out and said, we think it is Russian Islamic cyber jihadis. Which is terrifying, right? <laughs> it's, it's like the scariest thing you can... Is anyone here Russian? No, good. Uh, it's the scariest thing you can imagine. It's, it's not that I don't like Russians, it's the accent, right? So they think they're going to be evil, uh, and then, of course, anything that's an Islamic jihadi is going to be scary at the moment, and anything cyber makes it even scarier. In reality, the only thing they really were was kind of cyber, because it turned out to be a 15-year-old kid in his bedroom in Northern Ireland. You assume in his bedroom, because where else are you going to be, right? <laughs> when you're 15 years old, hacking into stuff. So this was curious. 15-year-old, he, uh, he exploited a SQL injection risk. We're going to talk about SQL injection later on and show you how easy it is to actually break into a site at risk of that. He was 15. There was another kid, a bit older, 16. There was this really old guy. He was like 20. <laughs> he broke in. And this is who it was. It wasn't Russian Islamic cyber jihadis. It was kids, or very near kids, breaking into these systems. And this is kind of the point of the child's play thing, where it is so easy to get into these systems. Like, the vulnerabilities are so low-hanging, and the tools to exploit them are so easily accessible that we see stuff like this. Now, that's kind of very, I guess, childlike hacking. On to something that's uh, a little bit at the other end of the spectrum. Adult Friend Finder. Now, in case you're looking at this and you're thinking, I like friends. Maybe it's a social networking site. You might be able to meet some new people. You might actually meet some new people. They make it pretty clear after you sign up what you're there for. There are not many guarantees on the web. <laughs> not many like this, that's for sure. So they are a site which is pretty much like Ashley Madison in terms of their intent. They're there for people to have affairs. And they had a little incident back in about May last year. And they got hacked, and there's this security notice 
you know, the usual thing, really sorry, we got hacked, evil cyber hacker jihadis, yada, yada, yada. But one of the things that they said in here, there's one line here, one sentence, which is underlined, the thing that they wanted to call out to everyone's, intention, to everyone's attention, like the most important thing to them, was that your credit cards are okay. It's like, yes, your wife knows that you were having an affair, and it would have been wise you're worried about, because we know after analyzing the data from breaches like this and Ashley Madison, they're basically all guys, and there are a small number of fembots. Imagine that, <laughs> having to explain to your wife. So I was having a cyber affair, but it wasn't a woman, it was a computer. Don't worry about it. <laughs> we know there are a lot of fembots, uh, and we know there are fembots because when analysis was done on the Ashley Madison data, a huge number of the females signed up from IP address 127.0.0.1, which is odd, <laughs> a little bit strange. So this happened, and people were upset, understandably, because they're saying the problem now is people can find out if I was on this site looking to have an affair. And I thought that was kind of odd, because you can find out anyway. I'll show you how to do this. What you do is you go over to adultfriendfinder.com. Now, pro tip, if ever you do this in a public arena, do not log in. You may not be invited back again. So we're not going to log in. We are going to go up to the forgot password link, because this is where it gets interesting. If we go to forgot password, and we fat finger the keyboard, so we just whack in whatever we like, da, 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 come. we answer this really hard capture, invalid email. All right, so this account does not exist, which is interesting. I created a research account, research account, <laughs> called NDC 2015, because I did this last year, at notmailinator.com. Has anyone seen what Mailinator is? So just in case you don't know what Mailinator is, it's kind of awesome, you go mailinator.com, and you can send an email to anything you like at mailinator.com and then check the inbox. So if there's like, uh, the, you know, you need to register but you don't want to give them your real email address and you just want to get through the registration process, you can use this. That's mailinator.com. The thing is, though, a lot of sites, like Adult Friend Finder, will block mailinator.com email addresses. So what you do is you use at notmailinator.com. <laughs> and they don't have that. And in fact, what Mailinator does is you'll see they've got a whole bunch of alternatives, such as spambooger.com. <laughs> now, this is random, too. <laughs> They've got hundreds of alternate domains. And uh, obviously, they don't publish them all so that people don't build up lists of what are fake email addresses. Anyway, so what we do is we go, just go home on that one. I'll go back to here. I'm just going to copy that on the clipboard, because we use that in a moment. We go here. We solve the really hard capture. We go password reset. And it comes back and it says, guess what? Your email address is correct. It doesn't explicitly say that, but it tells us anyway, because there's an enumeration risk. It will implicitly disclose the presence of an account. And what happens now is you can go over to Mailinator, you can put in that address, and you can go open up the mailbox, and in here, we've got the password reset email. And one of the curious things here is they say, uh, another member may have entered your username by mistake. That's possible. Uh, your wife may have entered it, not by mistake as well. That's another possibility. So this is an enumeration risk. And the problem with enumeration risks is that they pose a privacy risk, right? Because they leak information. Now, Ashley Madison happened a few months after. So Ashley Madison got hacked in July last year. They had uh, quite a large number of uh, people that were disclosed, <laughs> about 30 million plus, hacked in July. And the hackers said, we don't like what you're doing. If you don't shut your site down, we're going to dump all the data. And they provide a little bit of proof, a couple of records. They were legit. We knew that Ashley Madison had been hacked. A month later, Ashley Madison hadn't shut down. They dumped all the data. Curiously, you'll notice just under that Ashley Madison banner, it says over 43 million anonymous members. It's not quite true anymore, because we know who 30 million of them are, and what they like to do in the bedroom, and what their credit card numbers are, and all sorts of other things. So Ashley Madison, data got dumped. And uh, in July, so before the data got dumped, but when we knew it was hacked, I thought it'd be curious to discover if there was the same risk, because people were saying the same things. They were saying, you know, look, we're upset, because now people can find out from having an affair. So I went over to the website, and I entered an invalid account. This is on their forgot password page. And I submitted it, and it came back, and it had this message. And when I saw it, the first thing I thought was, well, this is good, right? Because 
the bold text there is very non-committal. If that email address exists in our database, yada, yada, yada. You might have an email address. You might, no, we're not going to tell you. So then I went and created a research account. I do have a lot of research accounts lately. And, and I entered that, and I did a password reset on it. So this was a research account which I now know exists in the system. And it said this. Can anyone see the little bit of a difference here, right? It's very, very implicit, but the response is not the same. The response is different. And one of the lessons with this is that if you do want to avoid enumeration, you've got to go right down to the bit level and actually look at, is this file absolutely identical? Not just the body, the response headers as well. Is there any tell in there that gives it away? So I wrote a blog post about this, and I, I suspect they didn't like it <laughs> because they fixed it straight away. Like, next day, bang, problem solved. Obviously, they were getting a lot of attention at the time. I thought, OK, well, that sounds like a challenge. <laughs> Let's do this. Let's go and find another way. So I went to the login page, and I thought, what I'll do is I'll see how long it takes to log in. So I took my research account, and I knew that email address existed in the system, but I just fabricated the password 25 times. Here's how long it took. This was from a very geographically close location, low latency, not much network variance in play. Consistently, 500 to 600 milliseconds. There's a couple of times here where it's like the 800 milliseconds, 900 milliseconds mark. OK. Then I used a fake account. I saw this. You see the pattern? Isn't that interesting? What do you reckon this is? Some people say it's probably because when there's a real account, it takes longer to get the data back. If it's taking 400 milliseconds to return one record from your database, you have a different problem. <laughs> it's not that. It's that they were using a slow hashing algorithm. And a slow hashing algorithm is good. They were using bcrypt so that if they got hacked, it would take a long time to crack passwords and make it infeasible for a lot of them. There was the issue that they also stored them as MD5 hashes, and they all got cracked. But be that as it may, they were trying to do the right thing. So by trying to do the right thing, they introduced this other risk, which was disclosure. So in a case like this, you've got to hash even when the account doesn't exist, because you don't want to disclose anything via what is effectively a timing attack. So this, with regards to sort of the kids and the child's play stuff, this is child's play, right, to figure out if an account exists on a site or not. Absolute piece of cake. All right, another popular one. Another popular one in terms of uh, really simple attacks. And that's XSS. And we still see a lot of XSS. We see very effective XSS. I saw a, uh, a message just a couple of days ago about a vulnerability in Osram light globes because there is persistent XSS in the database. The frickin' light bulbs have got a cross-site scripting risk. So this always happens, right? Continues to happen. Interesting thing also, uh, many people think of XSS as normally like reflected XSS, which I'll show you in a second or XSS in the database, but there's another type of XSS that a lot of people don't know about, and you can find it by going to facebook.com, hitting F12, going to the console. Anyone ever see this? This is warning people about self-XSS. And what it says when you drill down into that link is, if somebody sends you a great big piece of JavaScript and tells you to run it in your console, don't do it. <laughs> because what the kids do, I assume it's kids, is they go, hey, if you want to see who's looking at your profile, run this JavaScript in your browser. And of course, when you run JavaScript in the browser, you can do just about anything. Just about anything. So that's a self-XSS. Let's have a look at real XSS, and I'll show you really briefly how cross-site scripting works. I've got this website, hackyourselffirst.troyhunt.com. I use this in a lot of my plural site courses. It's, uh, it's a really good site if you want to break stuff and not go to jail. So, so feel free to do that with this site anywhere from about 40 minutes now onwards. Um, it's got SQL injection risks, all sorts of things. But one of the things it's got is a cross-site scripting risk. Now, very basically, how this works, let's go and do a search for, like, foobar. And when we search for foobar, we're going to see foobar on the screen a couple of times. We get a foobar up here in the top right-hand corner, and we also get a foobar down here in this heading. So what's happening is the web application is reflecting the input back into the response, which is fine. It's nice. It's user-friendly. But here's what I'm going to do. 
I'm going to take my little XSS attack, which is down here. I'm going to put that one on the clipboard. I'm going to paste that in, and we're going to see what happens. Now, is there actually anything interesting to see here? Anything out of the ordinary? Because something looks a bit broken. We've got this broken image. Let's have a look what's going on here. So if I have a look at this image, we can see that the source of this image is actually going off to evilcyberhacker.com, which is one of my websites. I use that for mostly for evil cyber hacking stuff. Uh, <laughs> and, and what I've actually done, you can see there's a query string parameter there, cookies. It's taken all of the cookies in my browser and sent them off to evilcyberhacker.com. And if you want to see how this works, we can drill into the source code and jump to the end of the screen, which is only the page. And what we'll see is that my search was everything from here down to here. So what I've actually done is I've found the place where foobar appears in JavaScript. And I've said, let's just close off that val statement, declare an image. The source of the image is evilcyberhacker.com plus the cookies from the browser. Append it to the body, and then there's a jQuery selector there to hide that attack payload where it would normally appear in the header. The relevancy of this is that if I can get people to follow this link and they are logged on to this website, I get their cookies. I get things like their auth cookie as well, which is the thing that keeps them authenticated. I can then create that in my browser and hijack their session. The thing is, though, how do I distribute this? Because I've got to get this to people. If I can get it to people and they click it, then we've got a problem. So for example, let's, we'll do an experiment here. Let's just tweet it, because then you guys have it. Like, if you want to see the mechanics of how it works, why would you log me out? OK, so we're not going to tweet it, because then I've got to do the 2FA dance and all that sort of stuff. <laughs> but every time I do tweet it and say, hey, don't click this link, a lot of people click this link because they're curious. Maybe because it's me, and they're like, you know, <laughs> it's going to be something funny, isn't it? All right, so um, reflected cross-site scripting is something that remains a really easy attack. And you might sort of look at it and go, but is this something that commonly happens, right? Like, this was pretty simple, but are many websites actually at risk? So last year, I was in the Netherlands, and I saw this guy do a talk at a security conference. There's a guy called Breno de Venter. He's a local Dutch journalist who does a lot of stuff on security. And he decided to test Dutch banks. And he recorded a video of what he tested. Con lo now, for clarity, all the motion, all the noise is all cross-site scripting. So this is reflected cross-site scripting. If someone followed this link and went to the bank, their bank would dance. There's a lot of problems with Dutch banks, obviously. When you have a look at the address bar here, you can see there's a little eval off the tail end there towards the right. Obviously, we're concatenating a string and then executing as JavaScript. This was vulnerable Dutch banks. Now, some of you seem to like this, the whole sort of premise of making banks to the Harlem Shake. So I'm going to show you how to make an Aussie bank do it. So what we do is you go and you grab this script. And you're going to want to make a note of line one, troy.hn forward slash Harlem Shake script, because after you see this, you will want to do it to Aussie banks as well. So you take that script, and we go and grab an Aussie bank, and we'll jump over to the browser. We'll grab something like NAB. And you hit F12, jump into there. You go to the console. You paste it in, and you run it. Con lo And the, the really neat thing with this one is that all the menus actually go nuts as well. <laughs> now, this is fun, obviously, but is it actually security risk? Like, are we worried about the ability to make a website do the Harlem Shake just by modifying the console? Because you're kind of modifying it on your own machine, right? Like, is, is this a risk? Do we worry about this? Let me give you a back-to-back -back demo, and then I'll, I'll answer that question. So I run this site. Have I been pwned? Anyone been in this site? Keep your hand up if it was Ashley Madison. Ah, interesting. Interesting. Correct answer, too, by the way. <laughs> All right, so this site is a, a data breach aggregation site that, uh, that I set up a few years ago. 
When there's a major data breach, like Ashley Madison or Adobe or any one of 100 plus others, I load the data and I make it searchable. And at present, there's somewhere in the order of 1.3 billion accounts which are loaded into here. If you haven't checked this, you will probably find that your email address is in there against Adobe or something else you may not want to mention. Now, here's the thing. If I hit F12 and I jump into the console and I paste that same script and I run it, no dancing. Nothing dances. And not only does nothing dance, but we actually get ourselves a few errors down here in the console. So let's go and take a look what's going on. What we're getting here is the first two errors are saying refuse to load. And then the first one says refuse to load style sheet. There's an AWS address there. Because it violates the following content security policy directive. So my site uses a CSP, content security policy. And what a CSP allows you to do is whitelist all the sources that the browser may load content into your site from. And the way you implement your CSP is you go to the network tab, you reload this page, and we'll go and we'll look at the first request, we'll look at the response, look at the headers, and in our response headers, here is our content security policy. So here's the neat thing. A content security policy is just a response header, which is good. I mean, it's a really, really simple thing to implement. When you return that content security policy in the response header, you declare, I would like uh, for JavaScript to load from, say, the Cloudflare CDN, to load from Google because I've got recapture and analytics and stuff like that, and that's it. If you try to load script from anywhere else, it won't work. What this means is, is that if you end up having a cross-site scripting vulnerability in your site and you haven't done the right things in terms of outputting coding and all the usual XSS defenses, the CSP steps up and just blocks it. It'll also block things like running a script block in your source code. It's very configurable with the CSP. You can choose what you actually want to allow it to run, but by default, you can't have a script block because hackers love to put script blocks on pages. So CSPs are really awesome. Check them out. There's really good support across Chrome and Firefox. That's all I'm saying on that. <laughs> Some of the others, not so much. However, having said that, even if the browser doesn't support it and it sees this CSP response header, it's just like, uh -huh. life goes on. Just ignores it. You're back where you are having no CSP whatsoever. So at the moment, based on global browser statistics, it's something like 60-something percent of browsers can recognize pretty much everything in a modern CSP. So they're a good thing to have. All right, so CSP is pretty easy. Now, getting back to the whole kid thing for a moment, uh, kids love DDoS. DDoS is very popular with the kids. Anyone see uh, Nissan got DDoSed by Anonymous in January? Why do you reckon Anonymous would want to DDoS Nissan? They're from Japan. Japan does a lot of scientific whaling. So Anonymous decided we're going to DDoS Nissan. And they just started throwing packets at them until they took Nissan.com or Co.jp or whatever it was at the time offline. It wasn't a very good reason, but they don't need a very good reason because DDoS is so easy and it can be hard to trace. Now what we're looking at here is a static image of uh, Norse. And Norse does this sort of DDoS mapping of what's happening at the moment. Now here's the cool thing. You can go off to map.norsecore.com just here, and then you hit F11 as well to put it in full screen because it does this look kind of awesome. Assuming the hotel Wi-Fi actually plays nice. If this loads, <laughs> what we're going to see is that static map we saw before animates. And there's bullets and things going everywhere and all sorts of images showing that this is where DDoS attacks are coming from. Because it's not Oh, it is loading. Oh, very, very slowly. There it is. What it's doing is it's showing where the attacks are coming from, where they're going to. And then down the bottom, you get some stuff like uh, attack types. Often, we see DDoS over things like SMTP, which you'd normally use for mail. You get packets thrown over SMTP. We've got a bit of NTP there, the uh, time server. We've got uh, a bit of HTTPS. You often see a pattern in terms of where the traffic is coming from and going to. And that there's this spot towards the right side of the map, which tends to send a lot of stuff to this spot on the left side of the map <laughs> on a very regular basis. 
Now, by no means is this a foolproof thing, and it's a little bit of a pew pew kind of map, but it's kind of cool. Like, if you've got a big screen in the office, just put this up, and people will walk in, and they will think you're awesome straight away. <laughs> Uh, because it is kind of awesome. All right, so that's interesting. It shows us what's going on at the moment. Uh, now, what I thought I'd do is let's actually have a look at how people mount DDoS attacks, because you probably all heard this before and thought, well, th this sounds interesting. I might like to know how to mount a DDoS attack. And you can go and get online DDoS services like this one. Hello, hackers. I'm Krista. And I'm here to promote Grapo's professional, cheap DDoS service. It's strong, fast, and trusted with no time limit. What we do is we take down large websites, large forums, game servers, and website blogs. You can blow your competition and web enemies away. You can reach us at Skype, Yahoo, or MSN at the bottom, and we look forward to doing business with you. <laughs> Where do you start with what's wrong with that? Um, She's such a cute kid. She's running a DDoS service. <laughs> kids do like the DDoS service. In fact, kids like DDoS for a couple of reasons. Number one is that, let's face it, kids like throwing their toys. And that's basically what a DDoS attack is. You know, I'm going to throw my toys and have a tantrum. Not much more than that most of the time. The other thing is that very often people use DDoS attacks to do what Krista just said, blow your web enemies away. So what they do is they play online games. Right? And when you're playing online games, latency is really, really important. And they will discover the IP address of one of their opponents, and they'll mount a distributed denial of service attack against that IP address so that their latency goes up, and you get to blast them with the BFG or whatever it is they're using these days. <laughs> get to blow them away. So this whole sort of premise of, uh, of kids and DDoS, you know, there are these services, which is one thing. The other thing that we see a lot with DDoS is we see stuff like this. Now, this is something a bit different, because this is actually crowdsourcing your DDoS. So you've got to remember, DDoS is a distributed denial of service attack. If there's only one of you and you don't have any friends, it's just a denial of service, and it may not work, because it's just one of you. You've got to be able to throw enough packets at your adversary to interrupt the service they're running or the game they're playing. But if you've got a lot of friends, and you can get them all to play the same game as you, now you're onto something. So what we're seeing here is we're seeing calls to arms, for want of a better term. And you're seeing the, the word loik used here quite a bit. This is the low orbit ion cannon. And this is a free tool available from SourceForge that became very, very popular a few years ago. It was used to great effect against the likes of PayPal and Visa when they stopped taking payments for WikiLeaks because the anonymous folks got pissed because they thought WikiLeaks should be able to get payments, get donations got all their mates together, and they started mounting these attacks. Now, I want to show you how easy this is, but I, I thought we'd make it a little bit more interactive. Has anyone here actively done a DDoS attack before? No, I didn't think so. All right, so I've got to find someone here who hasn't done one. What about you? Because you're just kind of closest, and you didn't put your hand up. You've never done a DDoS attack. Can you help me do one? Yeah, come on. It'll be fun. Let's go. All right. What's your name? Guna, OK, we may, after this, we may need your address, um, tax file number, <laughs> that sort of thing as well. Uh, so Guna, uh, are you from uh, here, or have you traveled from somewhere else? OK, you're from Sydney. Now, you're going to mount a DDoS attack, and the important thing is that you're going to do it, not me. Uh, so I'm going to stand over here for the camera. Now, since, you've, uh, since you're here in Sydney, is there, is there like a football club you don't like, or something like that? Not sure. What about Trump? Do you like Trump? No, good answer. All right. Uh, all right, so here's what you're going to do. We are currently focused on the URL. If you type in trump.com, OK, now what you're going to do, after we hit trump.com, you're going to click the lock on button next to it. Now, this is a very uh, high-tech technique. What it's going to do is it's going to resolve the host name to an IP address. OK, there it is, trump.com. Now what happens is, you see we've got uh, down towards here, we've got port, method, threads. You're going to choose a method. And we're here on the web. We're going to choose like HTTP or something like that. It's probably fine. And then you get to choose the number of threads. Uh, so this is basically, how much do you not like Trump? <laughs> <laughs> OK, so you choose, yeah, OK. You really like him, don't you? 
The other problem is other people's computers. It's always weird, right? Uh, OK, so we'll give it a bit of 100. Now, OK, so what you're going to do now is you're going to go and hit the button at the top right, which says, I'm in charge of my laser, whilst I stand back. <laughs> and it goes. All right, now stop, quick. All right, good. <laughs> now, here's the thing. If all of you did this at the same time, not from this hotel Wi-Fi, <laughs> but from different locations spread out around the world, you'd send enough packets to Trump.com to hopefully have some sort of an impact on the bastard, but who knows. But uh, yeah, that's it. Thank you very much. All right, give him a round of applause. Easy. But you know, here's the, the point on the more serious note. Like, how simple was that? Now, when you're a kid, and think back to when you're a kid, and you're sitting at home, and you're on the computer, and you've got other mates in various places. You may not even know who they are. It's all social media and everything. And they're saying, hey, just open this program, plug this in, fire your lasers, and then go out and play. This is what happens. And, and the really sort of scary thing about it is we're seeing kids brought up on charges and getting records for doing that. Because it is malicious, right? You get enough people doing it, it takes websites offline. If it is PayPal and you take them offline, imagine how much money it costs PayPal for every minute they're down. It's tens of thousands of dollars. So it has serious damages, but the problem is, is that the kids don't appreciate the consequences of their actions. Now, this is one way of doing DDoS. It's to get all your mates together and you, you sort of mount this attack. But oftentimes, people are actually using services. And there's a lot of DDoS services out there that can do the whole thing for you. And some of them actually look pretty cool. as soon as you saw Epic DDoS interface, right? Like that, up until then it looked good, but that was like, that's it, I'm in. Now, you might have noticed that they talk about things like stress test, all right? And often you'll see DDoS services referred to stress tests because that's what you do. It's meant to stress test your application. So therefore, we are a perfectly legitimate website. Please give us anonymous cryptocurrency and target whoever the hell you want to now because that's the way they work. They're designed for you to take down your web enemies and other things like that. These things come and go all the time. They stand up, the guys get busted, they get records, all that sort of thing, and then they disappear again. So that's DDoS, and uh, that's something the kids love. One thing that I'm conscious of, though, having kids myself, is that they're starting to get exposed to Wi-Fi very early as well. Anyone have one of these? <laughs> I don't think it's advisable, personally. The marketing material does say that it comes with a splash guard. I probably still wouldn't do it. But the, the thing is, is that you've got the kid there with the Wi-Fi device starting to do networky Wi-Fi things. And it kind of makes you wonder, like, how smart are kids getting with Wi-Fi? Like, how well do they understand it? And do they know how to do nasty things with it? And I went and found a kid who actually seems pretty switched on. I found lots of just, like, numbers and like signs just all together, which really doesn't quite make sense. But then when you go get into it, you'll get it and it'll like, it'll come clear to you. Betsy set up her computer to pretend to be the Wi-Fi hotspot, as it were, in the cafe. So when uh, the victim connected, um, they actually connected to her computer. And it was that way that um, all of their data went through her computer and she was able to see usernames and passwords and that kind of thing. Um, and it's known as a man-in-the-middle attack. Or a seven-year-old girl in the middle attack, apparently. Now, if I'm honest, I am a little bit suspicious of this video for two reasons. Number one, Betsy was drinking cappuccino. <laughs> now, look, maybe she's been up all night cracking Wi-Fi, I don't know. But it seemed a little bit odd. And the, the other thing is she was using Wireshark. Has anyone ever used Wireshark before? Keep your hand up if you actually understood it. <laughs> if you've still got your hand up, you're lying. <laughs> because it is seriously heavy duty, deep packet level inspection software that, uh, for me, seems quite complex. So for her, I think, is quite a stretch. 
But it, it kind of does make you curious, right? So how easy is it to actually mount a man in the middle of attack with Wi-Fi? So let's have a look. Here's what I'm going to do. We will jump back over to the browser. And uh, I have this little guy here running. I have a device on my desk, this really intimidating looking thing with all the aerials. Uh, don't turn your Wi-Fi's off, all right? This is part of the demo. It's good. So what this does, this is a Wi-Fi pineapple. Some of you may have seen reference to the Wi-Fi pineapple before. And what the Wi-Fi pineapple is doing at the moment, and it's been doing whilst I've been talking, is it's been looking at all of the networks that you guys have been looking for. And we see these over on the right. So your devices are actually broadcasting not just these network names, but 200-something other ones, which then scroll down off the screen. And this is what your devices do. They keep broadcasting what you're looking for. And every now and then you scroll down and you find one that people probably would not want to broadcast. But there's a lot of these ones, right? So all your devices keep broadcasting this. Now, I'm going to do a few demos. And what I'm going to do while I do this is just turn on some of the good bits. Now, if you want to actually have a look at your Wi-Fi over the next couple of minutes, what you'll see is all of these network names being rebroadcast. And you look at it, hey, the Wi-Fi here is crap anyway. We're not going to lose anything, right? <laughs> you'll see all of these. One of the things I've configured this device to do is in networking, I've got Betsy's free Wi-Fi. And I'll have that being broadcast here somewhere where I can actually connect to it. I probably shouldn't have started broadcasting everything else first. <laughs> but I'll be able to grab one of the, oh, Ryan's iPhone 6, interesting. I'll be able to grab one of these and connect through there and route my traffic back through the device. So this is the interesting thing, right? All your devices, as you wander around, are broadcasting network names you've connected to before. This is why when you go home and you walk inside and you pull out your phone, you're like magic connected. And then you go to work and magic happens again, except it's not really that magic. It's done by your devices broadcasting the names that they're looking for. So that's why we just saw that big SSID pool. So it's gone, let's have a look at all the names that your devices are looking for. We'll put them all in the pool. And then I just turned it on to rebroadcast the pool. Now, what will start to happen is people's devices will start to connect to the pineapple. And just for clarity, nothing malicious is happening. You just, your traffic's not going to go anywhere. Sure, says the Irishman. Anyway, all of this is in order for us to talk about HTTPS. So whilst this thing is spinning up, I'm going to show you a couple of things with HTTPS. As our traffic is now routing out through here, the problem is, is that anything we do that's over HTTP is now at risk, because all this is about the value of transport layer security. So if we go to an HTTP address, bad stuff may happen. If I go to, let's give it a bit of American Express. Oh, there we go. We'll, uh, we'll mute that guy. Uh, oh, here's a good one, FBI. OK, we'll mute that guy. <laughs> Let's have another one. But what, here's one of the interesting things. If any of you not on this network go to the FBI or go to Amex, you will see a padlock. But here's the thing. This is the trick and the problem with HTTPS, is that when you type fbi.gov into your address bar in your browser, does it go via HTTP or HTTPS? HTTP. And the reason you say HTTPS is because the insecure request goes to the FBI, the FBI gets that, and it responds with an HTTP 301, returns a location header, which tells your browser to then make a secure request. First request insecure, though. So that happens. However, let's try this. Have I been pwned? That loaded. Let's have a look at why that is. We'll, uh, we'll delve into this a little bit more. Let's explicitly go to HTTP, colon, forward slash, forward slash, enter, and now let's look at our network request. Now, here's what we're going to see. This first request is a 307. At least the first response is an HTTP 307. And if we scroll over here a little bit, we see it also went out in six milliseconds. Now, all of us have probably seen enough of this network to know that nothing's going to happen in six milliseconds, right? <laughs> so what's actually happened is that this is an internal redirect. That 307 does that. The browser is not allowing the request to go over an insecure connection, because we know that once it comes out of this PC, it's going to get into something like this and possibly get intercepted. And we do that with the response header as well. So if we go to the first good response, which is this one just here, and we go down here a little bit and we look at our response headers, we're going to see this one, strict transport security. And what this header 
which you'll often see called STS or HTT or HSTS for HTTP strict transport security. What it does is it sets a max age. Now this is about one year's worth of seconds. And it is saying that for the next one year, this browser may not make an insecure request. It will do an internal redirect. You can also see that I'm also including subdomains, which is pretty self-explanatory. There's a little remaining problem with this, though. What do you reckon it is? Right, you've got to get the first request. Now, this is uh, called uh, a TOFU paradigm, or trust on first use, in that you've got to get one trustworthy connection, get one trustworthy response, before you can actually get the header and then have confidence you're going to have security. We've got to fix for that, though, because what we do is we scroll over here and we do this. There's a preload directive. And I'm going to show you how preload works. What you do, I'll put that in my address bar there. I'm going to go to hstspreload.appspot.com, which also uses preload, so the connection will go just fine. And then I'm going to search for this Have I Been Pwned address. I think we've got to take out the scheme there and check eligibility. And it says here, haveibeenpwned.com is currently preloaded. This site is run by the Chromium project. And this site allows you to say, I want to have my domain preloaded into the browser. And what preload means is that for every single one of you sitting here, if you were to pull out your laptop, go into Chrome, have a look at your HSTS preload list, you'll see have I been pwned in there whether you've been to the site or not. Because preload bakes it into the binaries. Which means that the very first time you ever go to haveibeenpwned.com, even if someone's man in the middle in your traffic, even if you try and go over HTTP, it won't work. Which is cool. Now, there are some conditions required for this. So things like you've actually got to redirect your traffic. All right? So they want to see intent, that you do actually want to go over HSTS. You need to use include subdomains, and you've got to have that preload directive. So you can't go and find a competitor and go, I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to preload them even though they don't support HTTPS, because they've got to return that header, otherwise it won't work. So this is awesome, and this is a really good step along the path of HTTPS for everything. Let's go back to the pineapple. Oh, boy. So what's happening here is all of these devices under the host names are now connected to the pineapple. Anyone see themselves here? Doc's MVP. I can see Doc. <laughs> OK, there's something about the MacBooks that are, for want of a better word, promiscuous. Look at this guy. Niall's iPhone. Thank you, Niall. So, so this is the thing. Dinesh is up there somewhere. The Androids have a bit of funky naming. These devices are connecting to the pineapple, thinking they're connected to someone else. Number three. Number three. <laughs> This is why I love demos. It's just the random nature of all this stuff. <laughs> Go. <laughs> so, I mean, this is kind of scary, right? But the, the reason I show this is because it demonstrates how easy it is to man in the middle traffic. And you could be a seven-year-old girl sitting in a cafe with one of these because it is literally buy it off the internet for one or two hundred bucks, depending on the model you get, plug it in, you're rocking and rolling. That easy. All right, so that is Wi-Fi. And I'm now going to unplug this so it doesn't mess up any of my later demos or any of your things. All right, let's go into here. Let's have a look at one more thing. Now, you know this is serious hacking how? Footy. Very good. <laughs> I want to talk a little bit about SQL injection. Because SQL injection remains the number one risk on the web today. And it has that status for a few different reasons. One is that it's very easy to discover sites at risk of SQL injection. Every time you see ID equals in a number, and you change that number to something that isn't a number, it's a lot of sites which will then throw an error which indicates they may have SQL injection. I'm going to show you how that works in a moment. The other thing is, is that the impact when you mount a SQL injection attack is severe. It means getting data out of the system, personally identifiable info, passwords, it means potentially modifying data in the system. It means potentially running commands on the host operating system, because you can run things like XP command shell on SQL Server. You can't from SQL Server 2005 and newer, unless you run the command to re-enable it. And if the web app is connecting to the database with a command or with an account that can do that, well, then you've got a problem. 
The other problem as well is the ease of exploit. And that's what I want to show today. But first of all, a real bit of sort of basic SQL injection 101. We've got a URL like this. Doesn't matter what host it is, ID equals. And then we've got some code that's running on the web server that does this. And we've got this SQL string. And then it's going, OK, let's just get the query string. We'll whack that on the end. And then we've got a query like this, which is cool, right? Like we get widget ID number one. And then you change ID one to ID two. And by the magic that is data-driven websites, you get a different widget. Easy. Now, what if we do this? Because this is not a number. And this makes that command. What do you reckon happens if that command runs? It's valid syntax. It may not break. But it may do this. Now, here's the thing. If this error occurs in the database, and then that error bubbles up into the user interface, and you see this exception in the web app, it's telling you something about the database. And then the trick is, how do I now go and find or run queries which are going to return internal data? Now, before I do a demo of this, one more thing, because I mentioned that a lot of this comes down to how the web app connects to the database. And if the web app connects with a privileged account, then you've got a problem, because you're going to be able to do a lot of stuff. I'll show you a little trick just to figure out how bad this is. What you can do is you can do a Google Doc. Everyone know what a Google Doc is? This is like a really carefully crafted Google search to do stuff like this. Go and find things indexed over FTPs that are web.configs. Because Google indexes things over FTP, and people leave anonymous FTP access enabled. And what you end up with is all of these sites with FTP enabled, including government sites. Now, you could click through <laughs> to one of these, and you could see connection strings, API keys, other sensitive pieces of information in the web.config. But remember, this is anonymous FTP enabled. So you could also browse around the site, download files. Download that file called database.back, because there's a lot of those on websites. And if you're stupid enough to leave anonymous FTP enabled in read access, probably stupid enough to leave it open in write access as well. So now other people can modify the site. But getting back to the point about the account that people connect under, what if we filter this down a little bit? Because it's not hacking if it's just Google searches. And we go and we say, let's add an SA to that and see if anyone's actually connecting with SA. Some people are. This password, though, <laughs> fortunately is twice as strong as if it was just SA. <laughs> All right, so we know that people are connecting to these sites using credentials with privileged access. Part of the reason they're doing it is because other people tell them to. And you can go and find tutorials like this. This is a real live blog post from last year. And the reason I'm showing it is because it's got some really serious issues. And I left a really, really polite comment. And they didn't fix anything. And then there's people who've come along and said, thank you. This is very helpful. And stuff like this happens. So any, any possible problems here? It's eight characters. That's good. <laughs> and this one's curious, because as we scroll down, what we see is we see lines here which are very, very good in terms of SQL. This is parameterization, which is how we want to protect SQL injection attacks. So we've got email as a parameter here, and it's added separately down here. So you can't just change the value of email, which then changes the select statement. And then down here, a couple of lines later, the whole thing's appended in line. So by the time you actually get down and execute the query, the database has got no idea what is query and what is data. You can modify the query. Imagine my email address was single quote, semicolon, drop table, login table. Connecting with SA, it's going to drop the login table. But what I really want to show you is how easy it is to actually exploit one of these SQL injection attacks. Now, I'm going to get another volunteer. And I'm going to get the most hacker-like volunteer I can find. I'm going to get this guy. You look like a hacker. Come here. Come and give some help. All right. Now. First of all, how do I know he's a hacker? 
Very good. Now, what's your name? Ari. And how old are you? Six. And we've never met before, have we? Yes, we have, Dad. <laughs> <laughs> All right, moving on. Moving on. All right. Let's get Ari to hack this website. All right. No, not this website. Not this website. <laughs> Let's, uh, let's go over to this website, and I'm going to go back to here and get rid of that. Okay, now, let's just zoom back in a little bit. So, one of the good things about getting kids to hack is that they can't go to jail. <laughs> so get them to do it on your behalf. Okay, now, what Ari's going to do is he's going to choose one of these cars, and uh, he's actually choosing uh, a make here. He's gone for the, uh, oh, I do like the McLarens, I must say. All right, he's loading up the McLarens. Now, what Ari's doing here with his hacking attempt is he's going to go and copy this URL. Because if he can copy the URL, and we've got a really bad surface here, but I think he's, he's getting there. If he can grab that URL, then he's basically halfway there. Now, I can see Ari is now gone down the taskbar. He's finding Havage. And Havage is free SQL injection software. And it's very Mickey Mouse, for want of a better term. So what Ari's doing is he's plugging in the URL that he's just copied here. And now he's about two thirds of the way through. He's almost done. He's going to go and he's hitting the Analyze button over here. Now what's happening is this software is going and making HTTP requests to the website. And it's trying to find vulnerabilities in the site. It's finding the database. It's looking at all that. It's found the database already. DB name, hack yourself first DB. He's actually going way ahead of me. Uh, he's going, <laughs> He's going, he's going to go get the tables now, because he knows what the database is. He's pulling all the tables out. Here come all the tables. All right, this is all HTTP requests over the web. And now what he's going to do, he's going to pick a table that he actually wants to get data out of. Oh, he's gone straight for user profile. That's what I'd do. Good job. Uh, but he's got to get the columns as well, right? So he's going, all the columns are coming out. Oh, this is juicy. Now, what do you reckon he's going to go for? What would be valuable in the columns? Oh, that's a good choice. Yep, I agree with that. And the passwords as well. <laughs> and what's the last thing required to hack this website? And there it comes. Well, how about that? Well done. All right. Come down here. And now it is going, and it's, it's ripping everything to shreds. And that is how easy it is to hack websites. Now, which websites do you hack? Only daddies. Yeah, good boy. <laughs> All right, and on that note, that takes us through because that shows how easy it is to make hacking child's play. Thanks very much, everyone. <laughs> Good boy. Now, we've got a, a bit of time left. If anyone has any questions for, for me or for Ari, uh, let me know. Any questions? Yeah. Yeah, China. <laughs> so the question was, if you want to block traffic from any particular geographical error, is it possible? You can always do it via IP address range, right? Because we can resolve IP addresses to physical locations. But it's a question of, are you trying to do that casually in the sort of, we don't want you streaming media from the wrong country sort of thing, versus uh, are we trying to do that to stop a determined adversary? Because they're just going to jump on tour and go through an exit node or VPN out through another point. So you, you can for a very low-hanging fruit. How to do that? Ask it. Ari, how long does it take you to learn how to do that? The hacking? Uh, three days. Three days. <laughs> really? Good on you. <laughs> Anyone else? All right, well, thanks very much for coming, everyone. How's that? Well done, mate. Good boy. <laughs>